to God be the glory. Stonehenge, Amelia Earhart, Area 51. What are the biggest mysteries of all time? You know, there are some things we may not know on this side of time, but the great mystery is something that God wants us to understand. And He's given us His Word so that we can understand what God had in His mind from eternity for us. Today we're going to be talking about Ephesians chapter 3 and what Paul calls the mystery. I hope you'll turn your Bibles there and let's look together and investigate this mystery that God wants us to know. According to Giving USA, the top six most popular charitable causes in America are religion, education, human services, health, public society benefit, and the arts and humanities. These constitute 80% of all charitable donations and account for $295 billion every year. But giving to religious causes is double the second most common cause, which is education. It's almost 32% of all contributions. That means that for every billionaire donating to advocate for voter education and climate change or college scholarships and supporting libraries and museums, they are eclipsed by average people devoted to the cause of their church or religious beliefs. Doesn't this prove that we were created to believe in something bigger than ourselves and to do something about it? God made us with purpose. Barnabas encouraged the church at Antioch to continue with the Lord with purpose of heart, Acts 11 and verse 23. Paul acknowledged that Timothy had followed his purpose, 2 Timothy 3 and verse 10. But the Bible teaches us that God has a purpose that He calls us to embrace and to make our own. Romans chapter 8 and verse 28, Paul says, We are called according to His purpose. Ephesians 1 and 11 says that we are predestined according to His purpose. Ephesians 3.11 says that God makes known His many-sided wisdom through His church according to His purpose. 2 Timothy 1 and verse 9 says, We are saved and called according to His purpose and grace. He had this purpose in mind from eternity, and He calls us to join Him in accomplishing that purpose. I suggest that if we'll get a hold of that, we'll do more than give our money to His purpose. We will give our life and our all to that purpose. The point is that God has given us the supreme cause of all time to devote ourselves to. The Bible is God's means of communicating the specifics of that cause to us. As we study some lessons with regard to New Testament Christianity, we're going to try to learn some significant things about that cause. And my hope is that not only will we learn about it, but that we will yearn to be a part of it. I'd like to take just one passage that talks about God's purpose for us and see this concept that God wants us to understand. If you have your Bibles, turn to Ephesians chapter 3. We're going to look in the middle of that letter that the Apostle Paul pins to the church at Ephesus. And I'd like to see what Paul says about that purpose. In Ephesians chapter 3, beginning at verse 1, the Apostle Paul says, For this cause I, Paul, the prisoner of Jesus Christ for you Gentiles, if you have heard of the dispensation of the grace of God, which is given me to you, how that by revelation he made known unto me the mystery, as I wrote afore in few words, whereby when you read you may understand my knowledge in the mystery of Christ which in other ages was not made known unto the sons of men, as it is now revealed unto his holy apostles and prophets by the Spirit, that the Gentiles should be fellow heirs and of the same body, partakers of his promise in Christ by the gospel, whereof I was made a minister according to the gift of the grace of God given to me by the effectual working of his power. Unto me, who am less than the least of all saints, is this grace given, that I should preach among the Gentiles the unsearchable riches of Christ and to make all men see what is the fellowship of the mystery, which from the beginning of the world has been hid in God who created all things by Jesus Christ, to the intent that now under the principalities and powers in the heavenly places might be known by the church the manifold wisdom of God, according to the eternal purpose which He purposed in Christ Jesus our Lord, 
That's Ephesians 3, 1 down through 11. I'd like to take a few moments to examine this specific passage more closely and see why the Bible was written. There is no single text which explains the purpose of the whole Bible in detail, but this passage is a great overview. Paul refers to his subject as the mystery, that is, the unmanifested or private counsel of God, his secret thoughts, plans, and order. God has a plan for humanity, and he makes it known through the Bible. 2 Peter chapter 1 and verse 3 says, His divine power has granted to us everything pertaining to life and godliness through the true knowledge of Him who called us by His own glory and excellence. Let's look at what Paul says in Ephesians 3 about this mystery and how it solves the mystery of what God wants from our lives. As we observe our text, notice that first of all, this mystery is revealed. Ephesians chapter 3, verse 3 and 5. God didn't intend for this mystery to remain unknown and unsolved. And so Paul says that it was made known to him by revelation, and he shared it with these Ephesians in verse 3. He says that it was not made known to people in other generations as the Spirit has now revealed it, verse 5. He says he brought to light what had been hidden for ages, verse 9. It seems that Paul is talking about how Christ directly revealed His will to him as He had done with the other apostles when Jesus was walking the earth. In Galatians 1 and verse 11, Paul says, For I would have you to know, brethren, that the gospel which was preached by me is not according to man. For I neither received it from man, nor was I taught it, but I received it through a revelation of Jesus Christ. He received this revelation and he passed it along to these Christians in Ephesus and ultimately we were able to have it. We have the benefit of hindsight. We hold in our hands when we hold the Bible the completed revelation. And when we read it and study it, we get insight into God's plan and His will for us. Ephesians 3 and verse 4. You can take the Bible from Genesis to Revelation and you can see this mystery being revealed. It begins with a Savior being needed, Genesis 1-1 through 3-14. A Savior being promised, Genesis 3-15. His earthly lineage from Adam to Noah, Genesis 4-5. His lineage being preserved by Noah, in Genesis 6-9. through His earthly lineage from Noah to Abraham, in Genesis 10 and 11. His earthly lineage in the lives of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, in Genesis 12-50. His earthly ancestors becoming a nation, first as a people, Exodus 1 through 19, then with law, Exodus 20 through Deuteronomy, and then with territory, Joshua. That nation, before it becomes a kingdom, judges through 1 Samuel 8. The nation, before it divides in 1 Samuel 9 through 1 Kings 12, the book of Psalms through the book of Song of Solomon. The nation, after it divides, 1 Kings 12 through 2 Kings 17, Isaiah, Hosea, Joel, Jonah, Amos, and Micah. The nation, when it's just the southern kingdom of Judah, in 2 Kings 17 through 2 Chronicles 36. Before it goes into Babylonian captivity, Jeremiah, Obadiah, Nahum, Habakkuk, and Zephaniah. While it is in Babylonian captivity, Ezekiel and Daniel. And after it returns from Babylonian captivity, Ezra, Nehemiah, and Esther, Haggai, Zechariah, and Malachi. The 400 years between the Testaments. His birth, life, death, burial, and resurrection, Matthew through John. His church's establishment and expansion, the book of Acts. How his church should live, Romans through Jude. And where his church is going, the book of Revelation. And throughout all of that, he is revealing that mystery. A purpose that we're going to look at more fully later on in our lesson today. But the important thing for now is that he wrote it down for us to know and to understand it. Paul speaks of this mystery to the Colossians in Colossians chapter 1 and verse 26. He says, The mystery which has been hidden from past ages and generations has now been manifest to his saints, to whom God willed to make known what is the riches of the glory of this mystery among the Gentiles, which is Christ in you, the hope of glory. We proclaim Him, admonishing every man and teaching every man with all wisdom so that we may present every man complete in Christ. For this purpose also I labor, 
striving according to his power, which mightily works within me. Colossians 1, 26 through 29. It was God's will to make known the message that we teach to present every man complete in Christ. At Trafalgar Square in the city of London, there's a statue of Lord Nelson. It's 143 foot tall, too tall for passersby to see his features. And so some years ago, a new statue, an exact replica of the original, was made at eye level so everybody could see it. In the same way, God is beyond our ability to see. But we have an exact representation of Him, the image of the invisible God in Jesus. To know God, we only need to look at Him. And through Scripture, we see Jesus. And so as we look at this concept to understand, we do see that. But then second, in this concept to understand, we see that this mystery is understandable. Verse 3 and 4. Paul talks about the mystery that he wrote beforehand, which refers to the earlier part of this letter. You'd flip back in your Bible to Ephesians chapter 1 and begin your reading at verse 9, where Paul says that it was purposed in Christ and summed up in Christ for all nations to be saved through Christ. Bible writers refer back to earlier Bible writers to remind their audience of earlier truths that were already revealed. This same word used in Ephesians 3 and verse 3, wrote beforehand, is the word that Paul uses to refer back to the Old Testament. In Romans 15 and verse 4, he says, For whatever was written in earlier times beforehand was written for our instruction so that through perseverance and the encouragement of the Scriptures we might have hope. It's also the word that's used by Jude in verse 4 when he says, For certain persons have crept in unnoticed those who were written about long ago for this condemnation, ungodly persons who turn the grace of our God into licentiousness and deny our only Master and Lord Jesus Christ. Jude then goes on to refer to things written before. The wilderness wandering, the angels in Noah's day, Sodom and Gomorrah, and Moses' death, he uses things written down in the Old Testament to explain a New Testament truth. The idea is that God chose a vehicle of communication that He created us to use in order for us to learn, and that's writing. The knowledge and use of writing is almost universal, and God chose writing to convey His message for us to know it. The word write means to express thought by inscribing characters on a surface. You know, New Testament writers use a formula for introducing quotations from the Old Testament by saying, it is written. And so in referring back to his writing, Paul is telling us the medium that God uses to relate the mystery of the gospel. If you have a letter from Mark Twain in your attic, it could be worth a lot of money. You know, a personal nine-page letter written to his daughter in 1875 sold for $33,000 when it went on auction several years ago. Ordinary correspondence from the author of Tom Sawyer usually brings $1,200 to $1,500 a page. Experts say that even though Twain wrote 50,000 letters during his lifetime, demand is still strong for these personal notes from one of America's favorite authors. In Scripture, we own a priceless collection of letters, 21 of the 27 New Testament books, and they contain messages from God to us. And just as importantly as the written part is the fact that this mystery is understandable. Verse 3, one of the powerful proofs of the inspiration of the Bible is how such deep truths are written so comprehensively. I love how this is affirmed to reassure me in my quest to understand God's plan and His will. Jesus said in His ministry in John 8 verse 31, uh, He said to those Jews who believed in Him, If you continue in my word, then are you my disciples indeed. And you shall know the truth, and the truth will make you free. God doesn't want us in the dark. He has not given us a book that's mysterious and esoteric, that's meant for a select few or for only preachers. The Sermon on the Mount has 1,032 words, but 84% of those words have just one syllable. Our nephew got us a great board game for Christmas, and we love playing it. It's called Poetry for Neanderthals. 
And the basic rule of this game is that you are trying to get people to guess words and phrases using words with only one syllable. You know, it's great for a lot of laughs, and it points out how hard it is to convey any message with very simple words. The brilliance of this God-breathed book is that God conveys truths that influence our eternity through words which we can easily understand. As David says, I understand more than the aged because I have observed your precepts. Psalm 119 and verse 100. The unfolding of your words gives light. It gives understanding to the simple. Psalm 119 and verse 130. Think of an example of this. One at the very beginning of the establishment of the church of our Lord. The people who heard Jesus preach for the first time were asked, What shall we do? Peter's reply was simple and understandable. He says, Repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ for the remission of your sins, Acts 2.38. They gladly heard this word and they obeyed it, Acts 2.41. When it comes to Christian duty and worship and the church and any other subject that matters to our souls, God not only addresses it, but He does so in a way that we can understand Men may try to constantly confuse and complicate things, but that's not God's fault. Albert Einstein had a mind that could fathom the most complex ideas, but he was a fan of simplicity. He said any intelligent fool can make things bigger, more complex, and more violent. It takes a touch of genius and a lot of courage to move in the opposite direction. And he later added, Everything should be made as simple as possible, but not simpler. If a human genius could figure that out, what about the one who created uh, those of us who are and who aren't geniuses? When it comes to communicating his overall message, God made sure that he communicated to us and he did so in a way that makes sense to us and that we could understand. When we teach it, we should remember that and reflect the simplicity of Jesus' approach. And when we hear it, We shouldn't try to make it more complicated than it is. And so as we look at this mystery, this concept to understand, we need to understand that it is understandable. But with regard to this mystery, we need to see that it is meaningful. Verse 6. Paul tells us the heart of this mystery in verse 6. It's threefold, and it has to do with the gospel of Christ as it has been made available to the Gentiles. You know, the Old Testament is primarily devoted to giving us the history of the Jews who were God's special people in order to bring Jesus into this world. But it was always God's intention to allow people of all nations to be made right with Him through Christ. When we see that word Gentiles that Paul uses, that simply means non-Israelite people, a body of persons united by kinship, culture, and common traditions, a nation. And so what is the meaning of the mystery? Well, in the first place, the meaning of the mystery is that the Gentiles are fellow heirs. Fellow heirs are those who inherit or receive a possession together with someone else. And that word is found only four times in the New Testament and only once in Ephesians right here in our verse, uh, chapter 3 and verse 6. But the idea of of, of obtaining an inheritance is found several times in Ephesians. Back in chapter 1, Paul is doing something interesting in his use of the word inheritance in verse 11 and 14 and 18. There is no doubt that he is telling us about all the spiritual blessings that we get by being in Christ, verse 3. He chose us in Him, verse 4. He adopted us in Him, verse 5. He redeemed us in Him, verse 7. And He sealed us in Him, verse 13. There are so many perks to being a child of God. But he also tells us that we are God's inheritance. Verse 11 and 18. He sees us as his riches. You know, my dad always told us that we, his children, are his riches. And I think his point was that he would probably never be wealthy in material riches, but that we are what he treasured. Paul is basically saying that this is God's view. Of all that he owns, and he owns it all, we are what he prizes and what he values above everything else. Doesn't that humble you to know how much God thinks of you? 
through Christ, no matter what your race, your ethnicity, your gender, your income bracket, you have access to all that God offers to anyone. You don't have to be a Jew to get it. You've just got to be in Christ and to remain in Christ. Paul's about to say in Ephesians 5, 5 through 8, For this you know with certainty, that no immoral or impure person or covetous man who is an idolater has an inheritance in the kingdom of Christ and of God. Let no one deceive you with vain words, for because of these things comes the wrath of God upon the children of disobedience. Therefore, do not be partakers with them. For you were formerly darkness, but now light in the Lord. Walk as children of light. And so we're fellow heirs. But then this also points out to us as we come to get the concept of this mystery unfolded. The Gentiles are fellow members of the body. Paul is emphasizing the organic living and interdependent nature of the church. You know, nearly all of the body's cells that make up the tissue and organs and other part of us are called somatic cells. And the word for body in the New Testament is soma, from which we get the word somatic. And it's used 147 times in the New Testament. The word is used physically to speak of our bodies and also of Christ's physical body. It's also used to speak of the church in the books of Romans, 1 Corinthians, Ephesians, Colossians, and Hebrews. Ephesians speaks of the body as a place of reconciliation, Ephesians 2.16, and unity, Ephesians 4.4. A body has certain attributes, a nose, two eyes, internal organs, And if these aren't present, we say the body is deformed. The body of Christ ought to have certain traits too. We ought to be evangelistic in thrust and holy in life and balanced in teaching. We are what we eat. Considering what some are fed by the preacher from the pulpit, that's a frightening thought. You know, there are three concepts in Ephesians 2.16. Reconciliation or salvation. The cross, which is our motivation, and the church, which is the location of that reconciliation. In Ephesians, we see something of the exclusiveness of this body. Christ has one body, Ephesians 4.4. 4. We see something of the unity of this body, that a divided body has lost touch with the mind of Christ. We achieve unity by listening to our head. And we see something of its makeup. It is, in fact, a body. Bodies must be properly fed, otherwise it starves and it's malnourished. Acts chapter 20 and verse 28, that the Bible says that they, the shepherds are to feed the church of God, which he purchased with his own blood. Bodies must have periodic checkups. We should do this with the Bible school and with preaching and with our leadership and the spiritual condition of the membership. Bodies need exercise. You know, we've raised a generation and are raising another that's more overweight and inactive than those before it. We've been conditioned to inactivity. But we must guard against becoming entrenched in the passive state of apathy, Ephesians 5.14. We must be active. Bodies need protection. You know, the eyelids, the skull, the fingers, and the toenails all protect the body. And so there's protection in the body of Christ. Bodies are designed by God with many individual parts working together, Ephesians 4, 11 through 16. Don't forget that the spiritual body has a head, which is the control center, and a body cannot survive without its head. The church is part of the unfolding of God's eternal mystery, Ephesians 3, 10 through 11. From before time, God planned for the church to be His called out people from every nation and of every color. Then Paul also emphasizes that the Gentiles are fellow partakers of the promise, having a share with another in a possession or relationship. There was a time when the Gentiles were separate from Christ, excluded from the commonwealth of Israel, strangers to the covenant of promise, having no hope and without God in the world, but now in Christ Jesus, those who were formerly afar off have been made near by the blood of Christ. We have access to the same identity, hope, and benefits that God gives to the Jews who obey His Son. And Paul tells the Galatians, if you belong to Christ, then you're Abraham's seed and heirs according to the promise. Instead of division, strife, and rivalry, we're all one family, fellow heirs of God, and recipients of the promises that we read about in Ephesians 1, 3 through 14, and Ephesians 2, 11 through 22. God has given us a precious fellowship that encourages us and a status that elevates us. He's making this unity visible in the church of His Son. There are powers that take notice of this, and they don't like it. 
They're the structures of this world, and they're set up in a way that abuse their power. We see it every day from Washington to Wall Street and from Hollywood to Silicon Valley. God shows His wisdom and power through the church, and He calls us to partner with Him in that endeavor. We're not fighting for control of the world's money or power. We're fighting for the souls of humanity. In Ephesians chapter 1 and verse 20, God raised Christ from the dead and seated Him at His right hand, far above all rule and authority, power and dominion, every name that's named in this age and in the age to come, and put all things under His feet and gave Him to be head over all things to the church, His body, the fullness of Him who fills all in all. Our struggle is not against flesh and blood but against the rulers, powers, and dark forces of this world, against the spiritual forces of wickedness in heavenly places, Ephesians 6, 12. And Paul is saying here in chapter 3 that we make God's wisdom known through the church to rulers and authorities. God elevates us through Christ to show the world His wisdom through the church, which He allows us to be a part of. There is no more meaningful purpose that we can find in this life Anything else misses our purpose. Indiana Jones is the fictional character known for his bull whip and fedora and leather jacket and sarcasm and fear of snakes and deep knowledge of ancient civilizations and languages. And he crisscrossed the globe in a quest to solve the world's greatest mysteries, the lost ark, the temple of doom, the last crusade. He was an archaeologist and adventurer. He seemed more interested in the preservation of history than fortune and glory. That picture may be more exotic and romantic, but consider what we have before us in Scripture. Paul calls it a mystery, God's private thoughts and plans. But he has made it known through Christ and His church. And when we read, we can understand it and know it. God uses mysteries and parables to see how we'll respond, Will we dig and seek and knock and search? If we do, we'll find not answers but discoveries so exciting that we won't be able to stop. It will be more than information on a page. It will be the blueprint to the most fulfilling life possible. But if the kingdom of heaven is so valuable, why doesn't everybody do everything that they can, can do to be a part of it? Maybe it's because they don't understand the mystery. As we continue to search through God's Word, we're going to look more closely at this great mystery that's to be understood, and it will lead us to be in pursuit of New Testament Christianity.